Transform Baptist Church. If you're a visitor, we're very glad you're here. We love the gospel and we love Jesus and we love to preach Jesus and the gospel. Amen? Amen. If you're a, a visitor, that's what we're all about. And I ask that you open up to the book of Ephesians. This is the chapter that really birthed, in my mind at least, the uh, uh, purpose or the direction that this uh, series in the blood of Christ has uh, opened up for us and that uh, uh, has been uh, undertaken by us. There's a phrase here in chapter 1 in uh, uh, verse 3 and following. Listen to this. Blessed be the God and Father. This is Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The idea of Paul here is that, that we can get oversimplistic if you put one word to what Jesus has done for us and label that as it. If you just think, and many Christians do, maybe it's depending on which church you go to, have different nomenclature and idioms and, uh, uh, sorry, idioms, not idioms, some churches have idioms. Uh, 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 what language you might put, how would you describe what Jesus did for us in one word? Usually it's salvation. Or it's forgiveness, or it's one thing. But there's so much more. There's, there's in the, the blessedness that God has given to us that we might bless Him in praise. In what He has blessed us with, there is many, every, God says, every spiritual blessing. How can you quantify that? How can you put a number to that? How many blessings is that? We don't know. We just know that as many as the infinite mind could have comprehended, that many blessings He has entailed in Jesus Christ for us. And it's incomprehensible. It is incomprehensive. It is impossible to put into words the amount of blessings and the depth of each of those blessings that are in Jesus. But here is what turns this, this thought in my mind into a, a series upon the blood of Jesus is that it is in the blood of Jesus that all of these benefits are wrought for you and for I. It is in the blood of Jesus. Look at what Paul continues to say. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Look at that. He's going all the way back to the beginning. Before the foundations of the world, God started to bless us before you even had a great, 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 great grandparent in existence. Long before you were born, you were in the mind of God to be blessed in Christ. And then he goes all the way to eternity future and says, you know what he's blessed us towards? You know what it's going to look like? Being holy and blameless and perfect and sinless in his presence. Isn't that an amazing thought? Aren't you looking forward to that day? From that day to that day, all of those blessings have been planned by God. Look at this in uh, uh, beginning verse 5. In him, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. Again, he has predestined, elected, chosen certain people for what? For adoption in Christ Jesus, so that we for all ages will bless him forever and ever. Amen. This is going eternity past to eternity future from before creation to the endless ages of glory. But then he gets to the experience of the Christian. This is God's eternal purpose from past to future. But this is how all of that is then experienced by us. Something that unlocks those blessings from the mind of God and the eternal plan of God into our actual experience is this. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his Blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. The redemption that we receive or the, the actual on the ground benefits that come to us, come to us through from the mind, heart, plan, will, sovereign election and decree of God. It makes it from there to us by the effectual working of the instrumentation of the blood of Jesus, which unlocks those blessings towards us. So we're doing a session, a series, a, 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 a walkthrough on the blood of Jesus and how it secures for us the blessings, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place. Jesus Christ's blood secures these blessings. And we know this, that tonight, as we're talking about in verse 7, redemption. 
that you and I are redeemed. The common word would be ransomed. That's the same idea. We are ransomed. And again, maybe you're hearing this again, but we did one on being purchased. And you know what? We did one about being brought near. What, what material is there left to work with? It all sounds like you're really going to start picking at straws and maybe you're going to start quoting from Gandhi and some of the other stuff because surely the Bible's sort of, sort of exhausted at this point and we're not. Redemption and ransom are very, very different from purchasing and being bought. Did you know that? And being redeemed is very different from being brought near. So we're going to go through it. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And this redemption, look at this, this forgiveness, this redemption is in accordance with the riches of his grace. That means that when we talk about redemption tonight, we are talking about something that matches uh, uh, in degree and in amount and in expanse and in its, its breadth and height and depth. It matches the grace that is in God. It means that we, when we're talking about redemption, we are talking about the redemption, the buying back, the receiving, the ransoming of any of the worst kind of sinners, the worst kinds of blasphemous, uh, irreligious, cr- grown-up Christians or other religious cultists or spiritualists or whatever you may be, maybe just a sinner, outright sinner. You have, this is your first night in a church. We're welcome. You're welcome. I'm glad you're here. Or you know, whatever you may think. You, you are just far too gone. You sinned one too many times, maybe a million too many times. You're, you're too far gone. That is to say that God is somehow smaller and, and, and tinier than you. That you have done something in your experience that taps out over, that, 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 that surmounts his size, his greatness, and the grace that is in him, and that is impossible. The forgiveness and the redemption is in accord with the riches of his grace. Forgiveness is, is, is an immeasurable height in Jesus Christ. It is an insurmountable height. It is an inexhaustible depth and volume. And so we talk about it tonight, the redemption the buying back ransom power that is in the blood of Jesus Christ. We'll do well to work with the definition first. Uh, This is a simple uh, Oxford Dictionary kind of one. The definition of redemption is this. It is a release, a release effected or brought about by the payment of a ransom price. A release that is brought about by the payment of a ransom price. That is what redemption is, and that is one of the key pictures of the entire Scripture and Bible that we are given from the Lord God Omnipotent. To picture and to imagine and to understand and to comprehend just a little bit of our salvation as it is in Jesus is that it is a redemption. We first need to, or would do well to, and would benefit from, understanding much of how God wove redemption and ransom into the Old Testament law. In the Old Testament, for example, in Exodus 21, there was such a thing as a ransom price, which was a, a lesser, uh, a, a less difficult, or le- less, le- less rich, less harsh, I'm trying to find the word there, a, a less uh, poignant or powerful or potent uh, punishment if you did not want to uh, be put to death, basically, and hands up, Go figure, most people don't. That is the, this is the example. If you had a, uh, an animal and it had uh, gored, it had attacked, it had sort of gone, you know, it's, it's the pit bull, it's the dangerous animal, and it has attacked somebody in the past, and you were told by the local authorities, you're not looking after human life, your fence isn't high enough, it's not low enough, your soil isn't strong enough, they're digging underneath you, endangering kids, we warn you, formal warning, next time we put the dog down, and we put you down too if it kills someone. This is Jewish law. And then the next time, if that owner is still negligent and by his negligence breaks the sixth commandment, which says don't murder, that is that he's not only not murdering, but he's also not protecting life as he should. And so his animal gets out again, a bull, the example is in Exodus, and it gets out and it gores somebody, that is it puts its horn right through somebody's body and dismembers them and flays them and there they are dead. Not only will that bull be put to death, but also the owner will be put to death for his negligence. However, because it is still acceptable and logical and quite Uh, 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 evident to anyone who will study the case and any jury will acknowledge because it is the case that he did not set out with intent to harm with an intent to murder and kill it was it was an act of negligence if the family of the victim prefer 
to show mercy. If they allow in their heart, if they, if they permit the, 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 the criminal who has killed by negligence, if they permit him, then he may pay a ransom price instead of paying with his life. Be allowed. It would be the choice of the victim and the judge, but it was allowed. They could say, well, well, here's the ransom price we set. Now, if he said, that's a bit steep, I don't want to pay that. You know, Jewish after all, can we knock that down a little bit? How about we barter here? Oh, he's dead because he didn't want to pay the, Jew, the, the, the price. If he says, absolutely, anything is worth my life, uh, my entire belongings, everything I have, get rid of it in, in order that I live, then his ransom price has been paid and he is therefore redeemed from death. That shows us that sin requires payment before God for forgiveness. This is the the theological uh, lesson we need to learn before we keep going. The theological lesson we need to burn into our minds, which we've been doing each week as we go through this series. Sin requires payment for God to be forgiven from God. If you want forgiveness, and every person does, I've never met somebody who genuinely believes they've never done anything wrong, that if there really is an omnipotent being and a creator and a God, and if I meet him after I die, I've never met anyone that said, I will stand before him, her, it, them, whatever it may be, and I will be perfect, I will never have broken any law or any conscience. I've never met anyone that says that. Anybody uh, who's thinking about it will at least acknowledge, and this is Australian religion, yeah, sure, I'm not so good, but I'm not so bad as this guy over here. I'm sure I'll get in. Oh, he'll be kind. He'll forgive me. And through we go. We'll be playing some akadaka, drinking some four X's for eternity. It'll be great. Everybody acknowledges there's some shortcomings in you. Your hope is for forgiveness. You know that there's a God. There's evidence for a God. You've heard good arguments for a God, a God, but deep down you know there's a God anyway. And here in Scripture, you, you hear about a God, and, and this is the real, the true, the one, the living God. You want to think in your mind, I know I'm a, a sinner. Maybe that's the word that the Christians want to use, a sinner, a, a criminal, a, a whatever. I'm not perfect, but I'm sure there's room for some forgiveness. I mean, you've, you've, have you ever had maybe your car scratched at the, at, at the shopping center? And if you're not a bogan in one of those Nissan Pulsars or whatever, you're usually a little bit merciful. Right? You're elite. If it's an old lady, she bumped you, she's got these big, thick bottle glasses on. You go, look, I get it, it's okay, I'm not going to break your arm over this thing. You know, maybe, maybe somebody else's kid stomps, it's usually my kid, stomps on your foot as they run around the foyer. Somebody's serving you dinner and they pour some soup on you. Sorry, like as long as somebody's able to say sorry, most people, as long as it's not some horrible crime, are willing to show some forgiveness. Now, now here's the Australian, the, the, the humankind sort of logic. Surely, if I can be that kind... God can be that kind, right? I mean, he can just extend a little bit of mercy. If I say sorry, what's his problem anyway? This lesson of the ransom price being required for crimes in the Old Testament, the theological lesson you need to learn and burn onto your eyelids is this. There's no such thing as free forgiveness. If you want forgiveness, even for the smallest of peccadilloes and tiniest of sins that surely, surely every Australian commits, you want forgiveness for those, you require payment. You must pay. God requires payment. You must pay. Sin requires payment. Ransom must be paid in order for evil to be covered. However, Numbers 35 gives us another example. And it's the person who is under investigation for murder. Now, the the theory goes that because his axe head swung off while he was chopping in the wood, he says it just flew off and it hit his old enemy in the back of the head, and he's innocent. But other bystanders say that he chased him with half a bottle of whiskey in his hand, found him, and slugged him in the skull. There's competing stories, like what happened today. He said, she said. In Old Testament law, you were allowed to run according, along the highways and follow all of the signs, and you were allowed to run to a city of refuge. That was a safe place for those accused because if the family of the victim found you, they were legally allowed to kill you. However, you got to the city of refuge, you were allowed a fair, a a, a hearing uh, by jury and judge with evidences and the rest. If you're found guilty, then you can be killed. You can be capitally punished. However, there was never, ever a ransom price allowed or made payable for murder. 
And somebody under the, 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 the obligation of the city of refuge who's fled there, who is keeping safe until their court hearing has, has finalized, there's no one who could be under investigation for murder who could offer up a ransom price and then be freed back into the community, court hearing cancelled, jury sent home. There are some sins, in other words, in the Old Testament, there were some sins and crimes which were far too heinous for any ransom to be able to pay for them. There were some sins so horrible, that is the taking of another human life, they were too horrible to be covered by any dollar amount. God refused in writing in the law. There's no amount of money you're allowed to accept for these people if they have killed life. Because we recall from Genesis uh, chapter 9, particularly when God told Moses, if somebody snuffs out another human life, they must pay with the only thing of equal valuable accessible to them, which is their human life and no substitutes. The guilty must die. So there are some sins that God even told us in the Old Testament that no amount of money, no amount of compensation, no amount of ransom could actually ever cover. In Exodus chapter 13, we also are introduced to this idea of the ransom or the redemption for the firstborn. We need to do a little bit of history before we even get to the law and then some application. In the history of the Jews, we understand, we remember, they were saved up out of Egypt. Big, long story that we can't go into. But on the final night of their salvation, God poured out his wrath upon everybody who worshipped the Egyptian false gods. That wrath would include, the, 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 to, would also be against the Jews who had committed idolatry in the land of Egypt. God had given a provision to the Jews, however, and said, if you paint the, the, the blood of the lamb upon your doorpost, I won't kill you. I will pass over you. And we've studied this in one of our blood sermons as well. So if they, uh, 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 did, uh, if they failed to put the blood over their door, or for all of the Egyptians who did not put the blood over their door, the punishment upon that household was actually not widespread death. It was not death upon every member of the household. It was the punishment of death affecting every member of every household. That is that the eldest son, who represented the future, the inheritance, and the pride, and the legacy of the family, they would die. That is that the mother would not die, but every mother would attest this is a fate worse than death, the death of her firstborn son. That every father, if he was not an eldest born son himself, would see his eldest son die. And if he was an eldest son in his own nuclear family, there he would die. Every firstborn son would die. This was an application of God's justice and punishment for their idolatry, which the Jews were saved from, redeemed out of because of the blood of the lamb, and they found themselves in the desert after escaping. Then, in Exodus 13, sort of in this whole narrative, God tells them, after the night of the Passover, when you guys get into the desert, here's how it's going to work. This whole idea of the horror and the threat of a firstborn son dying, you know, it was good for your soul. That's what God was saying to the Jews. It was good that you sort of trembled there underneath the door with blood painted over it, and you held your little, your little your, your, your son so tight, and you prayed over him, you cried over him, hoping that he wouldn't die until the night passed. The sun came up. You heard Moses and Aaron calling everybody, let's go, we need to run, it's time to leave. And you were, you were liberated of that, of that condemning, torturous terror and horror in your mind. He says, that feeling for you was very good for you. It had a good effect upon your psyche. It reminded you of the, the guilt of your sins, of the severity of my justice and the freeness of my grace. That, that noise of Moses and Aaron calling out to the Jews, let's go, up, be gone, we're going to leave, out to the desert, we're freed, we're redeemed, we're liberated. That was the voice of a heavenly evangelist to every member and every son in every family who had been spared that night. What God wanted was for that effect upon the Jewish psyche to not wear off year by year or generation by generation. You know, because the preacher could get up in the temple and the tabernacle and say, you know, there was this time a few generations ago, we were back in Egypt, it was crazy, there was a redemption, and, and all of the firstborn sons, they, you know, they could have died, but they didn't, and it was great. 
Maybe they get personal and they sort of make an application. Can I, can I get a show of hands? Right, when we do this story in the Ford household, we put my son, my eldest born son in the middle of the table and we, we don't reenact, but we, but we show. We're like, this is what it looked like. This is what it would have felt like. Like he's going to be gone. Uh, Uncle Matt would have been gone. Right? We really try and make it personal. Maybe the Jewish preacher did that. He goes, can I just get a show of hands? All the first born sons. Yeah, you'd all be dead. Anyway, and he'd go on. For God, that wasn't a deep enough sermon. It wasn't a deep enough sermon. He needed, it to, he needed it to affect them. So what he did was he actually financially obligated them, right? Begin an agricultural sort of nomadic society. Animals were your economy. And, and what therefore he, he required of them in Exodus 13 is that he tells them, every time an animal has a baby, the first one that comes out of the womb, kill it. And if you think... That's a bit much. This is the, this is the first one. Remember, you should all be dead. Would you, would you prefer it to be your son? No, remember, the firstborn sons were spared. The animal can die. It was, it was a preaching of grace by contrast. But then when it came to the son, the human sons, you were obviously not permitted to kill because God despises human sacrifice. So you would not kill. You would not sacrifice. You would not offer up your firstborn son. That would come 2,000 years later. He would not be offered in that way. Rather, he would be redeemed. That is, the son doesn't have to die because the whole point of this analogy, this sermon that God was preaching to them, was that the eldest son didn't have to die. So to, to keep the point going and to drill this truth into their minds, the mercy of God, what they did was that they were commanded to take another animal, a lamb, another animal, and then in the place of their firstborn son, kill the animal. Now, now any older son, any kid's going to start asking questions when you start killing the pets. Right? We, we had this experience not too long ago in the Ford household. Off went the head of a rooster, tears bawling. Why? I, I, I killed a pet. I acknowledge. It was fun, and I'm glad I did it. <laughs> Nonetheless, the kid's going to ask, why? Why? Why am I going to do this? And they're commanded in Exodus 13, explain to your son. Tell your son why. He should have died. The animal died instead. This is a big sermon that if God's Passover justice kept on hanging over every generation of the Israelites, son, you'd be dead. He's not dangling that justice in this fearful way over us, but he tells us to remember that justice. And I fear that if we forget that justice... He might renew that justice. If we forget the wrath that we were spared from, by, and if we forget it by not doing this redemption of sacrifice, then maybe he will renew that wrath and kill my firstborn son. So it was grace mixed with fear. And it was redemption mixed with terror. But here the animal could redeem the firstborn son. This was God showing this principle in the scriptures of bringing life out of death. Death poured out. Blood poured out, death put forth so that life may result. An animal killed so that the firstborn son could be redeemed, kept back. Or, going back to our original definition, a release effected or brought about by the payment of a ransom. The animal was the ransom. The son was released from his sentence of death. Or... And, and we must remind ourselves tonight, theologically, off of the back of that, we must remind ourselves that just like every generation of Jews was supposed to remind their sons, them, their children, and themselves, we also need to remind ourselves that, as the psalmist said, if the Lord did pour down right now that Passover kind of wrath and justice, or as the psalmist says, if you, O Lord, should start to mark up iniquity and exact the just penalty therein, if God started counting his accounts and, and, and punishing those who owed him, who could stand, the psalmist says? Who, who would be left upon this earth, upon their feet, and not in the dust, not destroyed and consumed and suffering and agony to pay back? Who could stand? When God's creditors come through and, 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 and charge and his repo men come and gather everybody and put them in prison who owes him, there would be no souls left on earth. If God renewed that kind of justice, all of us, like firstborn sons of Egypt, would be slain. Then, 
There is the redemption or the ransom imagery in the Old Testament law uh, in Deuteronomy 25 and in Leviticus 25, and that is of the kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer is a lang- kin meaning family, those like you, those related to you. The kinsman redeemer was a responsibility uh, really that every Jewish man carried. And that is that if somebody close to you in your family came under some kind of difficulty, legal or situational, it was your responsibility to fork out the money, uh, uh, fork out the cost, or, or to do something of legal uh, uh, action in order to save them, solve their problem, and pay their debts. So, one example given in the Bible is that uh, you have family responsibility, familial responsibility, to buy back ancestral land. You have a cousin, maybe. Maybe it's your younger brother. And you, maybe it's his gambling problem, or his wife's just a big spender, or his you know, F-250 truck broke down, and he ended up mortgaging the land in order to buy back his truck. Whatever it may be, the land is now owned by another family. And that was land, in the Jewish mind, that's land that was allocated to our family by God back in the days of Joshua. That land belongs to us as an inheritance and a promise. We ought not just go, go flippantly misdealing with God's inheritance and, and blessings like that. We need to buy it back. We need to keep it in the family. So you go through, who's, who's the closest relative? Is it, is it John? Is it, is it Bartholomew? Is it Nathaniel? Is it Benjamin? Oh, it's, it's me. I'm the closest living male relative. It falls to me. The buck stops with me. I need to go and pay and redeem that land by buying it back into our family and thereby solving the debt of my cousin that I didn't know he had. So buying back land. It worked the same way if instead of selling his land, he sold himself or one of his children into debt slavery. That is that he couldn't pay the debt, so, so he, he said, look, my son, he can fix cars, he's great with animals, he's fine with, uh, 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 with the chores, he's worth a, a fine penny, and so he's purchased as a slave or a servant in somebody else's household, and therefore, when you hear about it, when you heard that, that cousin Bobby has sold his little Bobby Jr. into slavery, it is your obligation as soon as you hear of it, to get the funds together, to go to their farm, to go and find who paid, and to buy him back. You are the kinsman redeemer. You are the savior. You are the hero and the rescuer of those who are in in slavery or in debt. And we have this picture really drawn out for us in the most beautiful narrative in the book of Ruth. In the book of Ruth, she... uh, Uh, She's a young widow, a pretty widow, apparently, a very pretty young gal, and she has no children, but her husband is dead, and Boaz uh, 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 catches an eye for her, work in his fields. He likes to work in gal, but a bit of dirt under the nails. He likes the look of her, and he looks out for her, and and then he sort of does some digging, bit of of an online Facebook stalk material, and and then he finds out that, that they're related. Now, unless you're from Tasmania, that's not a celebratory sort of... Wife material, we share a last name, but for them, right? So he was, he was like cousins to her ex-father-in-law, so not even bloods, so that's all good. But, but, but legally, what that meant was that it fell to him or some, one of the other men, it fell to them to actually redeem that wife, to, to marry her, give her babies for the sake of, her, of the family line she once represented, and then make babies for your own line, and you would inherit, as you buy back all of her debts and you cover all of her owings, you would then inherit her lands, her family lands, and the lands of her fathers and her first husband. That is the kinsman redeemer. You save a woman from widowhood, from unemployment, from fiscal disaster, from poverty, from loneliness, and the family lands from being untilled and unkept, you redeem all of that back if you're a close enough relative to exercise that legal power. And even just describing all of those, surely we can see the theological principle and the glory of the Bible that all of the Old Testament was written to preach and point to and prepare us for Jesus Christ. Every instance of redemption was written by God in times past so that after Jesus came, we could go back and read those ancient writings and know these are not some writings of a distant, ancient, disconnected religion. These are our holy writings written by our God because Jesus is on every page. 
and you line up all of the Old Testament passages upon one another, and there's just this big cross hole in it that fits perfectly, the puzzle of Jesus Christ, which makes no sense without Jesus, and he makes no sense without the prophecies leading up. Jesus is the fulfillment of every redemption and ransom story in the Old Testament. Because Adam and Eve, in their sin, this was the problem. In the Old Testament, if under the law, it was an option for you, a financial last resort to sell yourself into slavery. But of course, if you are sold in and then you have children in slavery, you have by effect implicitly enslaved your yet non-existent children. That, that's something you've got to weigh up. Would I, would I rather be terribly impoverished, even indebted, or would I rather uh, uh, struggle in this way uh, uh, before I have children and then bring children into an impoverished home? I, I, or would I rather be enslaved and bring them up as slave children and in that way bind my family to this legacy? Well, that was a conception and a thought process that Adam and Eve did not have the courtesy of going through. When they stood there before the tree that God had commanded them not to eat, and the command ringing in their ears of the Lord God omnipotent who had just created the garden, the world, the universe, the angels. And then the voice of the slithering serpent, the demon, the, 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 the angel Lucifer, Satan, the accuser, the devil, telling them, you really ought to disobey God. You really ought to see uh, uh, how fun it is, how good life will be. You won't die, God's wrong, he hates you, follow me, I love you. They did not have the foresight or the courtesy or the wisdom to think, if I do this, then uncountable generations into the future will likewise be enslaved under the, 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 the death knell of sin, under the chains of, sli- of sin. And so they ate. They were condemned. They were guilty. They were cursed. And each one of us have been born into this human race under the capacity, the status, the legality as slaves. That's why Romans 7.14 says that all of us, we are sold under sin. That is our natural state. That we are sold off and we require a kinsman redeemer. In Jesus Christ and in his blood, as Ephesians 1 verse 7 told us, in his blood there is redemption and there is ransom for the lost for the vile, for the indebted, for the guilty, for the criminal, for the sinner. There is, there is redemption and ransom price, able and capable to pay for a million worlds worth of sinners. There is enough value, power, a, 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 a price in the blood of Jesus to redeem you if you stand here and you still know, I'm in sin, I'm not saved. If I die, I go to hell. That's you. Maybe you wouldn't confess it to your spouse or to your children or to your parents or to your friend that brought you, but God sees your heart and you don't need to confess anything. He knows. And if you're here right now and, and sin is weighing on your shoulders and conviction is like, is like prickles and thorns that every way you move stabs into your heart and every thought you have and every day you live, they, they prick and they, they make your heart and your soul to bleed. If that's you, then the good news of Jesus Christ is tonight that he has shed his blood in order to pay the price, the ransom, and the redemption to save you from sin. We see him fulfill this picture in the redeeming of the Son. In a, in a bit of a twist, in a bit of a flipping of the imagery upside down, Jesus is both the firstborn Son of God, and yet he's the one who dies. He's the, he's the firstborn son of, uh, son of God who, well, I guess in the imagery of the Old Testament, if he wants to live, then he needs a sacrifice. He needs a redeemer. He needs a replacement. He needs a substitute. But Jesus did not come to be spared. Jesus came to spare the rest of us. He did not come in order to find an escape from death. He came to taste death for everyone. He came not to escape the suffering and escape the wrath of God, but to look at it full bore, face on with our sin dressed upon him and take it on and consume it all and be crushed under the millstone of God's wrath. That's what Jesus came to do. And so he is both the firstborn son and the sacrifice in that the firstborn son in God's family dies and is killed under the wrath of God in order for life to come to all of the other siblings, and that's you and me. 
It's all those who believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the redemption of God's children. Or we think of the limitation, the limitation in the, in the Old Testament ransom system where God said, uh, yes, criminals, uh, yes, the negligent, uh, yes, death by accidental homicide and manslaughter. They might be ransomed, but, but there is a limitation on the ransom uh, capacity of, of money. It can't ransom the murderer. And to that, Jesus' blood answers and speaks a better word. It says that even for people like Cain, the first murderer, like people who have paid for or pursued or sought or given or taken or had abortions or hated somebody in their heart, which is the act of, of a soul-level murder, Jesus tells us, or for any other sin and every other sin, which in God's court is worse than a bull running over a child in the streets in the Israel law code. Every sin is, in fact, unable to be ransomed by money in God's court, not the Jewish court, but in God's court. And yet there, where money fails, Christ's blood avails. He is able to pay and ransom and cleanse and, and redeem where no other substance could. His blood is the redemption of sinners and there is no limit or capacity or lid in any sense upon the redeeming power and ransoming value of Jesus' blood. Not under the economy of the blood of Jesus. There's a, a hymn. It says, what love could remember? No wrongs we have done. Isn't that a great opening question? What possible love could remember no wrongs that we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into the sea, without bottom or shore, our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest the vilest, the poor, our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. There is no limit, there is no sin which is checked off marked off in the courtroom of God, unpayable, unransomable, unredeemable. Every sin is able to be paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. And as a greater and more tremendous divine Boaz, Jesus is also our kinsman redeemer. That is, as, as the human race might have gotten together in some kind of uh, a conglomerate council, I don't know how it might work, and we got together, or, or maybe the finest of the Jewish scribes have sort of got together in 0 AD in Herod's day under the census. And they started to think and wonder, is there any kind of thing, creature, angelic or earthly, that is closely related to us enough that he could redeem us from our sins? I mean, we're, we are as a race as a human race, we are as a nation, we are as individuals, we are lost, we are indebted, we are sold under sin. Is, is there maybe an angel from, from a far distant corner of God's heavenly realm that could come down and, and maybe be just human enough that, that it could be humanish? We, we'd, call him, we'd call him Tim. It'd be very human. And if he died for us, then, then there'd be a, a kinsman redeemer. Or maybe, maybe, and, and then, the, and then the, the wise men roll into town. And they seem to have some kind of idea of a celestial sign of a new king. And, and maybe they start scratching their heads again. Maybe this is it. Maybe there's going to be born some kind of king, some kind of thing that could, could, that could be human enough, that could be Jewish enough. How would they conceive of it? Something able to redeem them as a close enough relative. And God's answer was in Jesus. God himself made like one of us. God himself made relative to us. God himself in the incarnation, being born in Bethlehem under that time of the census. God himself being born in the second person through the womb of Mary, being incarnated into a full and true human nature and experience and reality of body and soul, of mind and flesh. That thing was God becoming one of our relatives and the closest possible relative to the human race because he was one of us. 
But being one of us and God, he was yet greater than us. I guess if you're an impoverished, indebted, enslaved Jew, you want somebody who is like you but not like you. In your family, but smarter than you and not, not run into the ground financially. Uh, one of you, sharing your last name, but a lot more money. Sharing your family, but a lot wiser. And there marches in Jesus, who is one of us touching his human nature. He is one of us because he's living under the law. He's one of us because he shares our nature and our flesh and blood, and you prick him and he bleeds. But he is not like us because he's not sold under sin. He's not like us because he's not captive and bonded to the devil. He's not like us because he is more powerful than Satan, sin, death, and all of our infirmities. He is our kinsman redeemer. And so Hebrews 2, 14 to 15 says this, Since therefore the children, you and me, since the children share in flesh and blood, he likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has power over death, that is the devil, and deliver all those through, who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Jesus has become our kinsman redeemer, becoming like us, but greater than us, able to make a sacrifice to thereby redeem and pay the ransom price. All of our sins are paid. All of our crimes are covered. All of our debts are erased by the blood of Jesus. In Christian history, this theme of redemption from slavery has not only inspired uh, many to fight and abolish such things as illegal, illicit, man-stealing slave trade, but it is also before such time where abolition was possible or in situations where abolition was possible, the redemption themes of Scripture, note this, motivated Christians to invest in the slave trade. Some of my heroes from history are those Christians who invested in the slave trade and actually bought almost countless people on the slave trade. I, one of my, my heroes, I, I expect to meet him in heaven, started an order that sort of saw over a few hundred years, 900,000 slaves purchased under his, under his banner. Now that's a win, as long as you understand what I understand and you don't think what you think that I'm saying. Because I don't just love those Christians who own slaves. My heroes of the faith of times past have been those who have, at great cost to themselves, purchased slaves and then released slaves. They, they purchase those who are under the bondage of slavery in order to set them free and liberate them. Augustine of Hippo was one who, uh, his church, he has these, these records, these minutes, and talking about these Galatian uh, dealers who would come uh, 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 from uh, distant lands uh, in their boats, and they would check into the port of Hippo. Now, uh, Augustine's church in Hippo, they had a, uh, in North Africa, they, they had a ministry, a very, a very strange, wouldn't look good on the books, you wouldn't want to uh, explain it to your accountant, uh, slave purchasing ministry. Yeehaw. And, and they, would, they, would, they, would, they would get the rich uh, 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 people in the, in the church and the, the rich businessmen and women and they would donate and people on their death would put the church in their will to the, the slave purchasing account. <laughs> there they were. They, they had uh, that line on their budget with, uh, with Suncorp was just tabulated as slave trade and the Christian church had that. And they would amass their money and they would store up money and they would sort of sell other goods and things so that they could go to the port before the slave markets opened and purchase all of the souls upon the boat. They would take them back to the church, they would clothe them, they would dress them, and teary-eyed, often unable to return them to their homelands, they would, they would hear their stories of kidnapping. They would tell them the gospel of Jesus, and they would minister to their wounds. There's another story. During the 1100s, when the Muslim caliphate is sort of precursor historically to what becomes the very villainized and fairly rightly so but the uh, the pre historic precursor to the crusades was the muslim caliphate that took over much of north america and spain and as these muslim hordes had taken over the spanish christian nation they they they, they started what was called the reconquista the reconquering of their land the reconquering i love that it had been conquered they're going to reconquer it back for their own nation they'd been driven out so, so they fight these battles, they wage war in the 1100s, and they push the Muslim caliphate back down across the Gulf and out of Spain 
Yeehaw, senorita. They, they were excited, obviously. What a, what a victory. But, but in, the, in the time that it took to take back their lands, there had been hundreds and thousands of Christians from those villages, towns, and cities who were taken up by the, by the uh, uh, escaping Muslims and put on their boats and taken back to Muslim lands, largely in North Africa and over to the east. And there became a, a group of Christians called the Trinitarians, and they, not, there wasn't a theological statement. It was just a, a cool name for a Christian team, I suppose. I don't know what their logo was. Uh, yeah, it was a red and blue cross, so the Trinitarians. They started a movement where they would amass money. They would get donations from Christians. They would march and sail all throughout Europe. And, and they would get down south. And they would actually go to the markets where the Muslims had Christians tortured, butchered, uh, but often on sale. And they would go and they would negotiate at risk of their own life in a Muslim land under the caliphate, the military leader. And they would negotiate back the prices for Christians and they would sell them often at ridiculously high prices back to the Christians. This is, this is the Christian heart of liberation. This is, this is a small picture of the gospel. That they were bought. That day they were bought, those Christians in a far off land were bought from slavery in order to be freed. There's one more specific story among the Trinitarians and the, 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 the caliphate slaves that, uh, that struck me. His, his name was Raymond Nunatus. And in 1204, he was born. And he had been, uh, uh, amongst all of these wars, he had been uh, uh, joined into the, uh, the mercenary, into the Trinitarians. He was, he was a, uh, a, a, a worker for this cause in this case. And he believed in liberation. But it was after traveling and, and raising money and raising funds, after he was there in North Africa, to, North Africa to negotiate the release of Christian captives, his funds ran out, and having nothing left to offer, he offered himself up as a hostage to, to secure the freedom of others. While he was in captivity, being kept back in order to release others, while he was there in captivity, he was subjected to torture, and had his lips bored through and padlocked shut to prevent him from preaching Christianity. As a small part of me that wants to say, that's the only thing that could shut me up. There in a caliphate jail, still preaching, having given his life as a ransom for others, he was padlocked shut as a captive. He was eventually, by fellow Christians on their march through North Africa, bought, ransomed, and liberated. This is, this is just a tiny, tiny speck on the, speck of dust on the scales kind of image. But it is a tiny, powerful image of the kind of redemption that Jesus brings us by his blood. He doesn't just amass donations. He didn't just bring gold from heaven. He didn't just speak silver into existence and then, and then march up to God's court and offer something for us. Having nothing in all of existence or even in the infinite imaginative power of God, anything that could quell or satisfy the ransom payment, which was the justice for our sins. Having nothing else in his hands, Jesus gave himself to be tortured, enslaved, killed, that he might by his death and life pay the ransom for sinners. And as a result of that ransom, there is no sin that Jesus cannot pay for. There is no sinner that Jesus cannot redeem. William Cooper, his old hymn. Ever since by faith I saw the stream, your flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Friends, if you have not in this moment simply rested, simply fallen back into the infinite mercy of Jesus who promises you by his word, I have paid it all. Come home to the Father. I've ransomed you and I have redeemed you. If you have not done that, then do that in this moment. And in an instant, you will be forgiven of all of your sins and added into the family of God. Let's pray. Father God, the life of those, that, 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 that individual that was ransomed by, by Raymond. Uh, th those individuals, maybe they were multiple, that were released from their captivity and sent home from their shackles and allowed to leave out of their cells and seeing Raymond walk back in, surely every day of their life, now in freedom and liberty, 
would have been struck with the notion of being paid for by another's life. But God, I pray that the same kind of theme would run through our minds, that redeeming love would be our theme till the day we die. May shackles and holes in our lips not be able to padlock our hearts or mouths shut from praising you and speaking forth the power of the redeeming love of Jesus Christ. Please, Lord God, mark us as those who are like the Jewish sons, tangibly reminded by your Holy Spirit every day that we are not our own. We have been bought with a price and that we have been ransomed by the precious blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for the, for the, 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 the vivid imagery that your scripture paints. But we pray that the Holy Spirit, by his own power, would, would stain that picture with, 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 a, with a permanent uh, ink upon our souls so that we are constantly aware of that, of, that, of that depth of love which you poured forth in order to redeem us. That we might be constantly reminded and reminding each other of the wonderful, inexplicable, insurmountable, unimaginable cost that was paid by you, Lord Jesus, in order to have us back in the Father's household and family. We thank you for the redemption that is in your blood. We thank you that it is in nothing else but your blood and therefore relies on nothing else but your power. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this forgiveness. We ask, would you now just stretch out your arm and touch with your finger the hearts of those that are still in rebellion. Bring them home, ransom them, give them faith and new life in the Spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody said...